Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. everybody. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. We are coming at you live from the Wild Sheep Foundation convention and I am here with the first lady of Indiana, Miss Janet Holcomb, and your husband, Eric, is the governor making you uh, the first lady. Yep, that's right. Um, Yeah, we've been in office now. Uh, We're in our fifth year and uh, it's been quite an adventure. Well, I can speak, uh, hopefully for most of America, that we are so thankful to have um, our leadership. And as we know right now with everything going on in the country, how important our governors are in our states. And having you representing the state of Indiana here at the Wild Sheep Foundation Convention is such an honor. And um, we just could not appreciate your time and presence here uh, more, especially in this in this time of our nation. So thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule and being here. Thank you. Well, um, I am um, quite an advocate for hunting and shooting sports. I came to hunting and shooting sports later in life, and um, I, but I kind of dove in, and I absolutely love it. This is my first time attending yes. the Wild Sheep Foundation uh, convention here in Reno, and it's been spectacular. It's just uh, it's just a big family, mm-hmm. and I've met so many really wonderful people, and um, I fully intend to come back. So tell everybody that's watching and listening, how did you become the first lady of Indiana? (laughs) That was uh, an interesting year in our life. So in 2016, uh, my husband was uh, asked by then Governor Mike Pence Mm -hmm. to fill a midterm vacancy as Lieutenant Governor. So he was sworn in on March 3rd, 2016. We thought we were going to be running as a slate with mm-hmm. um, with Mike Pence for re-election that year. And four months later, uh, Mike got the uh, vice presidential nomination. He was asked to serve uh, with Donald Trump, of course, uh, and run for vice president. And we moved up the ballot then and had a 106-day campaign. So it came as Very quite a shock. Quick. <laughs> yes. Very quick. Very quick. You went from being lieutenant governor to your husband went from being lieutenant governor to governor very rapidly. Yes. Yes. Just a few months. So and now you guys were just Eric was just actually uh, reelected for his second term. Correct. That's correct. Yes. We were back on the ballot uh, last year, 2020. Well, Indiana loves you and loves everything you're doing in the state. But before I go into all the awesome things that you have brought to the state of Indiana as first lady. Can you tell your story of how you got involved in being um, an adult onset firearms owner and actually also adult onset um, hunter uh, as well? Yes. Um, In 2008, we were home uh, asleep. It was January, and our home got broken into uh, during the night. My purse was stolen. Fortunately, uh, the burglars left, and uh, it was just an eye-opening experience for me. The next morning when I woke up and found that my purse was missing and um and evidence of a break-in correct uh phoned the police then and of course they came out to do the report and what they said while they were there was it's a good thing you didn't wake up because we did not have firearms in home at time at that time i was kind of afraid of guns Mm -hmm. and um i'd grown up growing up in proximity of guns but i really didn't have a lot of experience handling them Mm -hmm. and understanding them Mm -hmm. but after that uh, I became very motivated Mm -hmm. so I I decided it was time to confront my uh, fears and uncertainties and um, I just started learning because you you realized at that point you know a phone call sometimes is it takes too long to have a responder even though you know now you have a, a lot of security around you but you still take the responsibility of your own security in your own hands and and I really respect that um, because there's a lot of people that become in a position of um, 
what is it, how do I want to word this? Let me pause this thought for a second. Um, Authority or Yeah, leadership. I don't know what the word is. Leadership. leadership. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people that end up in a position of leadership where you do have um, security around you because of your unique position. And, and you kind of, I, I don't want to assume that a lot of people get complacent with their own security, but I, I think they honestly do. And you're the absolute opposite of that. So, you know, you've went from like not owning a gun to now you are an instructor. I mean, this is, you've taken a whole nother level um, to your own personal security, which is, I really commend you for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just, I fell in love with it, quite honestly. So I started shooting with friends, um, bought one gun. And of course, um, you know, that leads to an, I call it gun math. Right. So one becomes three and then three <laughs> becomes eight. And then you stop counting. Yeah. You don't, sometimes you don't want your spouse to know how many you have. Right. All the guns, and you are, know what? You all the guns in the house like are shoes. mine. You can't just have one for one occasion. Purses, you have to have, shoes, exactly. whatever. Else. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Yes. So, um, yeah, I just I fell in love with shooting sports and uh, started with pistol yeah. and really kind of focusing on defensive and tactical training and um, then moved to shotgun and rifle and uh, decided I wanted to start hunting. And, and not only does she shoot shotgun and rifle and she runs over this like super fast, but the guys at her trap club she shoots with, when she started shooting with them, you know, she could go there and shoot. Now she goes there and cleans house. <laughs> so don't, you know, do, I, I appreciate your, your um, modesty or your humility with your ability, but you are like an extremely capable marksman. So I have a group of, um, I call them my girlfriends. They're all uh, 50 plus guys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that I, that I hunt with wing shoot yeah. um, and, shoot clays with quite a bit um but yeah when I started shooting you know I was hitting maybe half out of you know around a 50 I'd hit 25 yeah um yeah she now she's better than me I, I can't hit it now I'm, shotgun. I, <laughs> I either hang with the guys or out shoot them so yeah. yes yeah well if we went uh, trap shooting together I would be like uh Janet will you shoot one for me please <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll shoot back up. How yeah, about that? yeah, that's right. That's right. No, and then, so you not only do you shoot trap or sporting clays, you also have done a lot of instruction training as well. Yes. After I had been shooting for a few years, I started taking my girlfriends to the range, and I thought, gosh, this is fun, and they loved it, and I loved it, and um, I realized that it's important to con to present um, a consistent message, mm -hmm. use con a consistent terminology. And because you're laying the foundation for someone That's right. and you want them to be able to take that and build on it and mm -hmm. do other courses. So you, you want to have a solid start for, for ladies. And you're in a very unique position to influence um, people that maybe would be on the anti-gun side of things or on the fence with guns because you are in a, in a political position of influence you encounter a lot of people that you know most of us everyday people we don't we don't hang out in the same circles let's just you know put it honestly and so you know with your background you, you know you're able to influence and talk to people about safe firearms ownership how firearms owners are responsible responsible handling of firearms and and these types of conversations in small rooms and in and, and in different non-formal settings really can also have a lot of influence when it comes to legislative matters as well or the court of public opinion exactly i've always taken uh somewhat of a soft sell approach i think um with with regard to training and uh, you know encouraging people to get involved in firearms, um, it's been really fun though because and very rewarding because mm -hmm. I've had even friends who are pretty liberal mm -hmm. who have um, approached me after a number of years maybe and said, "Hey, you know what? I'm ready to give this a try. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to own a gun yet, but I'm at least ready to head to the range yeah. or take a class and and learn. Yeah. And I, you know I so commend anyone who's just willing to to learn, right? Yeah. Um, maybe you decide it's not for you, but mm -hmm. just have some knowledge yeah. and some understanding of, of firearms. Because what we hear in the media often is very- um, Negative. Is, is very negative, very biased, and, and quite often very uninformed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a firearm's not just gonna go off 
you know, a, a hammer or a firing pin has to hit a primer mm -hmm. for a gun to go off. Mm -hmm. So just understanding that. <laughs> trigger finger. That's right. Trigger finger yeah. or yeah. engaging the hammer. Yeah. You know, that was mm -hmm. um, something that came up here recently on a movie set, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so not, um, if you're going to handle firearms in, in any setting, mm -hmm. have a base knowledge to be able to understand if it's loaded. Mm -hmm. Training or plinking at the range is both empowering and fun. What I love about the Ruger LCP2 is that it is chambered in 22 long rifle, which is perfect for skill development and training. Plus, it's available in 380, making it a great choice for personal protection. As a safe, responsible citizen, join me in being a proud Ruger American safe, responsible, how to present a firearm, how to carry it, all of those things. So you've actually gone out, you've done a lot of outreach with your own community of girlfriends and friends and your own sphere of influence, which, I mean, I can think of, you know, of our 50 states. I mean, I can think of on a, less than a half, two handfuls of governors and, and leadership that really is, is super pro second amendment and you've taken your love of firearms to indiana and you're bringing a lot of competitive shooting sports into any you're bringing a lot of competitive shooting sports into into indiana for example the nra shooting sports are, are coming to camp atterbury yes it's really exciting um so uh a couple of years ago we really um, kind of embarked on this project but we are building a state-of-the-art shooting sports complex at one of our military bases, mm -hmm. Camp Atterbury. It's located uh, just about 45 minutes south of Indianapolis, and the NRA is moving all of their competitions to to Indiana. So um, we started a couple of years ago with High Power Rifle, mm -hmm. and we're adding some competitions each year. So this past summer, we hosted um, a little over 90 days Oh, wow. NRA competitions, and we love having them there. Um, great, great, great folks yeah. from across the nation there to compete, and it's, you know, it's just exciting. So um, I love getting down there during the competitions to see what's going on and um, to just to meet people and, and welcome them to our great state. Yes, that's, um, it's so important that we have a, a place to have shooting sports because the gun ranges and the availability of a place to shoot with urban development, it's not like everybody has the opportunity anymore to go in their back 40 and go planking. And so having a governor um, and a first lady that is investing in our shooting sports and making sure that there's a welcoming community for the entire state is so important. And um, I'm so thankful that there's a place in Indiana that, you know, people can go and shoot and, and be safe and, and enjoy shooting sports with friends and family and that's so important with our culture of firearms. It's uh, It's been very rewarding to be able to use as part of my platform as First Lady um, to have the opportunity to be an advocate mm -hmm. for this and for uh, encouraging individuals and families and, and people from every walk mm -hmm. of life to get out and enjoy this sport. It's, it's incredibly safe. Mm -hmm. Once you have a base of knowledge and, and understand. And it's addictingly fun. It is really, really fun. It is so fun. And the fellowship and, and everything is. And, and I think it's really empowering, especially for women. A lot of women are afraid of the noise. They're afraid of the recoil. And then, you know, you shoot a firearm and you realize, well, I've got ear protection. I've got eye protection. I'm safe. This thing is not going to hurt me. I am in control. And it's empowering. It, it, is, it, it is, is empowering. So fun. And what's exciting for me is that there have been or there have been occasions when I've worked with women that have never. Typically, the women I work with have never held a gun. Mm -hmm. And there's been many occasions when I'm out on range with women, and their hands are just shaking because mm -hmm. they're so nervous. I have to remind them to breathe and. Mm -hmm. um, but once you get through a couple of magazines, mm -hmm. they start to calm down and then you start focusing a little bit on accuracy mm -hmm. and, you know, within half an hour, they're shooting tight groups. Yeah. Women are really good at uh, listening and uh, taking information and, and transferring it to, to the, the skill. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so rewarding to see someone who goes from being really nervous to all of a sudden shooting tight groups. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they walk away and 
take their target with them and it's it's a badge of honor you're like i did that i hit that i'm so awesome you did the kind of natural progression from in my opinion natural progression i love guns and shooting to i'm also a conservationist i'm an outdoors person i love you grew up around horses and you love being in the outdoors you and your beautiful dog um what is his name again Henry? Yes. So my dog is Henry. You and your dog, Henry, love to go hiking. And and so it's like natural for you to step into now being a hunter. Yes. um, You know, it was um, just a growing process for me. So, yeah, it was another way for me to connect with the outdoors and to enjoy being outside in nature. That is what really rejuvenates me. Mm -hmm. And particularly after we took on these jobs Mm -hmm. of governor and first lady, that is that's my go to, mm-hmm. you know, that's what that's what resets me and um, just being outdoors in doing anything, hunting, mm-hmm. fishing, hiking, whatever it is. Um, you know, I just love being out. Hey, I'm Christy Titus, and for the past several years, I've really come to rely on on X hunt for mapping both in and out of the field. But now I'm also using it to plan and research units for my application season. Onyx has teamed up with Topret to show you everything that you need for draw odds in most of the Western states. And access to Topret services is completely free to all elite members. I now have both the power of Onyx Hunt and Topret to help me strategize my state hunting applications. If you haven't already, download Onyx Hunt and upgrade to the Elite membership to access Top Rut as well as other great Elite benefits. So. Your first big game hunting experience was the Wyoming Women's Antelope Camp, was it not? That's right. So this is what I love about some of our governors in this <laughs> in our country. Um, Jenny Gordon is the first lady of Wyoming and um, she invited you. Her husband, Mark, is the governor of Wyoming and she, um, I don't, her state welcomes roughly 45 women into Wyoming to do a women's antelope hunt. And it's a really incredible learning experience where you can learn how, you know, basic stalking skills and they have archery and they have fly fishing and fly tying and cooking and they teach con- conservation principles. But you went there as a guest um, two or three years ago. It was in 2019. Okay. Yeah, so... um, Another great state. Yes, yes. yes. So, um, you know, we have a really great camaraderie Mm -hmm. amongst um, other governors Mm -hmm. and first ladies, but I have to say when Jenny and I met, like, Mm -hmm. instant click because because we both love hunting and the outdoors and um, shared passions. You know, we we just automatically clicked. So she invited me out to the Wyoming Women's Antelope Mm -hmm. Hunt and uh, went in 2019. Mm -hmm. And it was just an amazing experience. So um, yeah, it was really my first big game hunting. I I had done a little bit of whitetail hunting Mm -hmm. in Indiana. Mm -hmm. Very different, of course, you know, tree stand versus spot and stock. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just love spot and stocks. Mm -hmm. So I love walking and being, you know, sitting in a tree stand's a little, I get fidgety. (laughs) (laughs) I do too. (laughs) Sitting still is hard. (laughs) Yes, it is. Being quiet is hard. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And the stalking is the fun part. It's the adrenaline seeking part. And it is, it's, it's very rewarding when it all comes together. Yeah. It's so great. So, uh, it was just a tremendous event the Mm way, you know, from, from day one and, um, all the way through the end of the, uh, time we had there together. Um, it's, it's even kind of a field of fork experience. Mm-hmm. They talk about cooking mm-hmm. and pre- preparing different mm-hmm. cuts of, um, different types of meat from the animals. And so it was really and fun. Jenny has actually launched a really great, um, why the, it's like a Wyoming hunger initiative where they have, um, taken a lot of the harvest of, of, of the state if you you know want to harvest a wild game animal um, and don't need the meat they've got a great food bank program where you can donate meat to and and they're really doing a lot to combat um, hunger in Wyoming and I really um, love seeing two women that have so much influence work together and come together because the two of you you know you were you had just started hunting you'd done a little bit of whitetail 
now you're exploding and the two of you have so much opportunity to influence so many people I mean your entire constituency in your states look they look up to you as women and, and they say well if these women can do it um, I can do it and right. that is so empowering uh, and I love seeing women like you ladies and I'm so thankful that there are um, red states out there that are uh, hunting and, and embracing the hunting culture as well and, and when you left there we actually went on our elk hunt in Colorado so if you guys that are listening or watching this you want to watch her episodes on um, Carbon TV and then also my YouTube channel and it's titled First Elk for First Lady. And we had a great hunt for elk in Colorado. It was we so did. much fun. We did. And I want to commend you, too, because you do so much oh. for women in hunting and, and um, just promoting this incredible way of life, mm -hmm. these traditions, and um, passing it forward to the next generation. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we, um, we hunted in southern Col Colorado. Yes. And just... A magnificent yeah. experience. So it was um, it was hard work. Uh, five the days. Elevation. The elevation. The elevation's um, a grind up there. Like yeah, it, coming from Indiana, <laughs> <laughs> and then we're I'm like at ninety <laughs> five hundred feet. Everybody's sucking air. Oh, You're like, man. Whoa. I remember more than once when I had to uh, to tell our group there, mm -hmm. um, I need a break mm -hmm. <laughs> because the elevation. You yeah. Know, I try to stay in good shape and I work out quite a bit but yeah. the elevation is tough. it's always an adjustment when you're hunting but what I think you know what I love about hunting and I'm sure you also appreciate it is when you're done you're like man I did that and it's yes. such a tremendous accomplishment you know it you is. put one foot in front of the other you refuse to quit and there's success at the end of the journey hopefully <laughs> uh, but in our case Not in that always, situation yes yeah yeah you know you've got a beautiful bull and um and, uh, you know, where are all of your trophies now, Janet? <laughs> well. <laughs> I love this story. <laughs> Sorry. Did you write so, up for that one? So, uh, my mounts arrived a couple of months later, of course. And um, when I received them at the governor's residence, um, my my husband said, where are you going to hang these? And um, I said, well, they're going to go in our event room mm -hmm. at the residence. And uh, because there's a really nice, tall ceiling in that room and uh, I knew they would look great and he you know um, we had a little bit of a debate I'll say for a couple of weeks uh, he was concerned that some of our visitors might not appreciate having the mounts in there um, of course the mounts are where I intended <laughs> Why and even have this conversation with her like he, knew he who might was be the married. governor I don't know the first lady <laughs> <laughs> but they do look great That's and right. um and people really love hearing yes. the story when they come mm -hmm. in and visit and and um learn that i you went hunting yeah that yeah. i harvested those animals mm -hmm. and that, so they, it, i think people are really intrigued by it mm -hmm. and um you know again it's an opportunity to talk to people who might not have a lot mm -hmm. of exposure mm -hmm. and not only that it, not only does she have her her harvest hanging on her wall proudly in her governor's mansion they also feed their guests the harvest from her hunt. So, you know, you get to bring this extra culinary experience to the, the first house in Indiana where, like, um, you know, there's, I'm sure there's other, other governors that have done the same thing in Indiana, but you guys are a very red state. But how impressive is that to your, to your company when it you're telling this field to fork journey? It is fun to, um, to tell visitors that I harvested the entree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I hosted a wild game dinner a couple of months ago and we had seven different types of wild game mm -hmm. and it was just, um, it was really fun. You know, it's always great to, to share the harvest mm -hmm. and to share the stories mm -hmm. and, just a great way to spend time with friends. Mm -hmm. There's always a story and a memory and it, and it leads you on a mental adventure and your guests on one too. And hopefully, yeah. you know, at some point you're enticing uh, people that maybe have never been hunting to, to consider experiencing it. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as we know um, in your position as well, um, hunters are truly fueling the conservation movement and we have done so since the 1930s with the 
inception of the North American model of wildlife conservation. And, and you know, with that, you have this huge opportunity to inform your guests how hunting is con conservation through license and tag sales, funding 75% of state conservation buz budgets through PR dollars, which comes from the sale of fire legal transfer of firearms and ammunition. And, you know, we're truly fueling that grassroots effort. Absolutely. And all of that has kind of maybe led you in a way to the Sheep Foundation convention here. It has. Um, and yeah, so the more I learned about conservation and Pittman Robertson mm -hmm. and uh, the North American model. And so over the years, I just, um, you know, just conversations mm -hmm. around the literal or metaphorical campfire mm -hmm. um, with other hunters mm -hmm. and conservationists. Um, yeah, it's the, the more I learn, I think it's kind of been a, a really interesting journey mm -hmm. and gotten me more and more involved. And mm -hmm. um, did you know that I have a sheep hunt? Yeah, I, so I was going there next. I was like, this lady not only is at the Wild Sheep Foundation Convention, she's got the sheep bug. Okay. I it's have you've bug. been bit. I've been, yes, yes, yes. Um, yes, I'm heading to the Yukon um, this August. So that will be my first sheep hunt, mm -hmm. and I'm very excited. Oh, you're a little have bit an intimidated, time. but excited. Oh, you know what? It's, it's the most defining moment of your life. Um, when you when you accomplish that you're gonna you're gonna understand it's you've done something and, and it's different than any other feeling I think in the world I'm excited uh, and I'm excited uh, for I, you I to love have challenge that. Mm -hmm. so and I love um, I love having hunts like that scheduled mm -hmm. because it's a great motivation to work out mm -hmm. you know when you're you know not feeling like heading to the gym maybe yeah. knowing that you have that on the calendar yeah. it's kind of gives you that extra little push to yeah Gives you something Stand to work shape. towards. Yes. You know, it's a goal exactly. and exactly. it defines your why and a purpose. And, um, you know, we've been very fortunate this week here at Sheep Week that Janet has shared her story of her home break in to your journey now to being an, a hunter and, and a soon to be sheep hunter um, with, with the members of the wild sheep family. And I think, and I can't say this again, how important it is that we have our decision makers that are invested in the hunting heritage, that are invested in how hunting does really fund conservation. And, and you know, we're seeing it with some of these tags that are selling here and they're going for a lot of money. And it will just, sheep hunting is not an inexpensive sport, but it, they're, with the Sheep Foundation family, you know, there's raffles and there's auctions and there's ways for people to come in and have that chance of being a sheep hunter. And whether we're sheep hunters or not, we're all here to put and sheep put and keep sheep on the mountain. And, and one thing that Guy Eastman said today that I found incredibly intriguing was that hunters, sheep hunters specifically, worldwide harvest less than 1% annually of the population of wild sheep. And the dollars that are raised here and the stewardship that is done here, um, the revenue that's created here, there would not be wild sheep if it weren't for places and, and programs like the Wild Sheep Foundation and for the North American model. And with a less than 1% world harvest rate, I mean, hunters are literally putting tons of energy and momentum into the conservation movement without asking for very much back. Exactly. Some of these tags sell for hundreds of thousands of yes. dollars and that money is not that not the sheep hunt Janet's going on. No. Let's just clarify no. that right now. <laughs> we aren't buying these tags. So yes. But there are people yeah. uh, there are hunters out there yes. who have the means to yeah. uh, to buy these tags uh, from different states that uh, it's a tremendous mm -hmm investment and mm -hmm. boon for those states that's money directly back to those states that's to, exactly right. to help conserve animals for the future mm -hmm. that's incredible and they're doing collaring programs and testing programs and their density programs relocation programs you know where you elk hunted with me two years ago um five years ago they did a sheep reintroduction into the one of those canyons at river canyon there and there was a sheep population roughly 20 miles away in similar terrain but there was no sheep on that particular ranch so the landowner worked with colorado parks and they actually reintroduced sheep into that canyon within five short years there is now a huntable population in that canyon that landowner has done a tremendous job making sure that he has great habitat from noxious weed removal to water um, improvements so those sheep always have water great habitat and they're thriving and it's not just um 
And there's a lot of people that would have this misconception on some of these reintroductions on private land as well. It's only going to be for p paid hunting, um, you know, public resource, and only you know somebody that's wealthy could buy a tag. Well, these landowners are are actually it's not working that way. They also have tags for the general public, and these landowners are doing them as guided for free trips because we want public hunters to be able to go in and see the land stewardship and the wildlife stewardship projects that they have done without cost. Because a lot of people also don't know how to judge a sheep how do you age a sheep and, and a sheep you know we we want to harvest the old rams that don't have a likelihood of survival and so they they actually have staffed guides that are going in and ensuring that you're harvesting that objective you know that older age ram that's past his breeding years and and selectively harvesting and managing and just to see you know that go full circle from hey there was no sheep here five years ago to now you and i everyday joe hunter has a opportunity to potentially be able to go into these areas and hunt that is that is what we're spearheading here and that's what we're doing and, and that's a remarkable um, accomplishment in, in such a short time that's right Hey everyone, after successfully using Rack One Big Game Peanut Butter and their super yummy PB&J in my spring bear baits, I'm really excited to share with you guys two new premium bear attractants from Rack One. One is Picnic Basket and the other one is Jelly Donut Flavors. Like every good Picnic Basket, this tantalizing blend contains a variety of irresistible snacks and treats to whet the appetite of any and all bears that come within range of its powerful, alluring aroma. The carefully blended mix of fruits and nuts and other secret ingredients put out a picnic spread and long distance scent trail that'll have the big fellows inviting themselves over to a party. I think it's safe to say that we all love donuts and that bears will also love to wake up to a yummy donut. Rack One's Jelly Donut is an aromatic mix of fruits and nuts blended with Rack One's secret ingredients formulated to lure bears in where you want them. The aroma is intense and nose catching even at long distance and will send the snack signal far downwind. All the Rack One flavors are sure to lure them in and can be placed wisely near trail cameras or your hunting stand. The rest is easy. All you have to do is make the shot. Also by harvesting the older rams, you're allowing the younger rams to breed more. So it's improving the mm -hmm. genetics of the herd. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's so exciting for me to just, um, to know what an impact mm -hmm. hunters have on populations of animals controlling predators mm -hmm. is a is a huge um, I love that you just said that that is a huge <laughs> um, topic for debate right now there's so many important things when it comes to wildlife management as a whole that we need to look at science-based management policy and and I love that you know your state really looks at that with everything that you guys do in Indiana and I think that's Thank important you. across the country to have a science-based management program what are you doing in Indiana right now like going forward what are your what are your big projects for the state this year anything exciting one thing I am uh, spearheading this year is working with our Department of Natural Resources mm -hmm. to do a kind of first experiences mm -hmm. um, initiative for, uh, to bring people into the outdoors. Mm -hmm. So in the last two years, since the beginning of COVID, we have seen nationally and in our state uh, a huge increase in the number of people who are visiting our parks, mm -hmm. national parks, state mm -hmm. parks, um, camping, hiking, there's just been a, a huge influx of new people mm -hmm. who have really don't have a much of a history in doing these activities, but people were looking for ways to spend time with their family and friends mm -hmm. and to get out and being in the outdoors was a safe place to be right mm -hmm. now. So what I am hopeful of is that we will transfer um, more skills and more experiences to these, to this group of people who are new to the outdoors mm -hmm. so I'm uh, working with our uh, DNR mm -hmm. to um, to encourage people to get out and hike mm -hmm. and so I'm going to be doing a, a number of activities um, over the coming year to to engage people in 
maybe try fishing or mm -hmm. whatever it is. So, and that's yeah. all in addition to your accelerated program at Camp Atterbury as well. That's so you're correct, continually yes. bringing in new sh shooting sports and new disciplines to yep. your facility there. And what a, Indiana is a great state to hunt. If you guys haven't hunted Indiana, there is a lot of hunting. Turkey hunting and whitetail hunting is really what you guys are kind of famous for, bread and butter. Yes. Um, and both of them, tremendous opportunity. You guys have done a great job with your wildlife management. Your deer numbers are great. Your turkey numbers are flourishing. And you hunt both uh, religiously there. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, headed home tomorrow and um, in I'll be home for about four days and then I'm headed on a duck hunting trip too. So um. I love you. You're like my <laughs> spirit first lady. I'm like, if I had to be a first lady, I want to be Janet. She's amazing. <laughs> oh, well, I have fun. Yes. I certainly have fun. But yeah, there's a lot going on uh, across the state. There's a really interesting project um, in northern Indiana. Um, the Nature Conservancy mm -hmm. has a, a property that's uh, several thousand acres there. And they actually have reintroduced bison. Oh. So it's a prairie restoration project where we're um, seeding the prairie grass back to natural mm -hmm. native grasses, native yeah. grasses native and vegetation. Yes. Yeah. And they've reintroduced uh, bison and mm -hmm. a portion of this property. And I love getting up there to visit. They started out with um, about a dozen bison and now we're um, close to 30. Yeah, it's just really fun. That is really fun to see the, it's like, Indiana's not like the Great Plains, but I mean, that, that's what you think of when you think of in, like bison in, in yeah, native habitats yeah. of like, this is the Wild West, they're bringing it back in Indiana. And yeah. that's that's a really awesome program. I didn't even know you guys were doing that. I We're gonna have to, next time I go there, go see this bison herd and, and just kind of take a look at it. Thank it, you so much for everything you do. Thank it's, you. We are so fortunate to have you here at Sheep Week. We're fortunate to have you and your husband in a leadership role, representing hunters, representing the Second Amendment, um, and really looking out for um, our way of life and um, and representing that here at the Sheep Show. We you know we need more people like you here so you can take our message back to um, back to a whole different demographic, and that's what we need for the hunting heritage and our Second Amendment to continue. So well, thank you. That's um, something else I've tried to sort of focus on and and emphasize this week is mentorship mm -hmm. so uh, you know I think um, it's how I got involved mm -hmm. really in in hunting and shooting sports is through friends and learning from people who'd been involved for decades sometimes um, so you know I really encourage everyone to just find one person mm -hmm. over the next year mm -hmm. to to help um, pass along this heritage and tradition mm -hmm. and let's change the optic of hunting it can be men it can be women it can be kids you can be any race color creed religion we don't care everybody is welcome in the hunting and outdoor community Absolutely. And, and I think COVID's really taught us that um, there's something precious that cannot be bought or can never be taken for granted of being in a wild place yes. um, you know this six foot social distancing and lockdowns and all of this I mean it has made me absolutely cherish taking in fresh air on the mountain and listening to the leaves rustle in a trees uh, you know all of these beautiful sunrises and sunsets and um, there's nothing more spectacular than being in the wild and um, I'm so thankful that you bring that message to Indiana and to the world um, for other first ladies to look up to you and um, you know maybe invite them into this space and bring them into this space where they can have an understanding as well so yes. thank you so much for everything you, you do and I appreciate your time uh, thank you guys all for joining me and Janet Holcomb on Wild Land Cut podcast live from the Sheep Foundation here in Reno thank you again Janet so much I appreciate you very much thank you likewise Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.